In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. We are in the great time between the ascension of our Lord and the Holy <coughs> Feast of Pentecost. These days was the very first novena with the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Apostles, who had now, by now, on that first nine days after the ascension, all the apostles, the first pope, and the bishops recovered the Catholic faith. They now believe our Lord Jesus Christ is truly God, that he truly rose from the dead. They saw his wounds, they saw his scars, they heard his voice, they ate food with him, they received his blessings, he washed away their tears of repentance, he received them as sons. And he commanded them as bishops, by now, go preach to the world, to all creatures, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And then our Lord lays down uh, the sledgehammer. And this sledgehammer with a, like a maul, it is a, it's a divider, it's a sword. Who believes will, will be saved? Who does not believe will be condemned? And that is the voice, that is the command, that is the words of God who became man. And he, he alone had the right to say it. He alone had the authority from the Father to say it. And all the other false religions that exist and are put on an equal, equal level now with, all the, with the true religion in our age of the horrible blasphemy against Almighty God and the First Commandment, the sin of ecumenism, and ecumenism, it's, it's a deadly disease that infects all of us. We are all infected in some way by this disease. And uh, modernism and liberalism and all the deadly isms that, that, are, that are like pestilence in our air that we breathe. But our Lord, He is the one that lays down that axe. He puts the axe to the root. And He divides, as St. Paul says, the, the sword of the Spirit is a sword that cuts into the very hearts of each man, into the very marrow of our bones, so that all of us have to choose. Do I chase after the spirit of the world, the, the, the pleasures to the flesh and the passions, and to the devil? Or do I choose the way of the cross, our Lord Jesus Christ as King, as our God, as the eternal high priest who promises in this life a lot of tears, who promises a steep climb, who promises a narrow path that's, that's wrought with dangers and uh, many enemies firing at us. We have to all of us choose. And as Archbishop Lefebvre said, Catholics before us, they all had to choose. Actually, if you look at the whole history of the church, there's never been a, really a time when Catholics were free from making a deliberate choice to stay with the truth. And for doing it, suffered something. For the early Catholics, the apostles, it was death. Death or compromise. For the first 300 years of the Catholic Church, it was being fed to the lions, imprisonment, suffering fines. Or, if you compromise, you can live free like all the pagans. And for the, for the, from the 4th to the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th century, was the great attacks of the heresies. And how many holy monks were actually put to death because they chose to paint the icons. In the East, there was the horrible uh, iconoclast persecution were so many priests, so many monks, so many devout Catholics who kept statues, kept the icons of the Mother of God and our Lord Jesus Christ in their homes. And it was the practice, whenever Catholics entered their home, they made the sign of the cross. Whenever they left their home, they made the sign of the cross. And a practice in many Eastern homes, and still in Ukraine today, when they enter a home, they, they see the icon of the Virgin Mary, they bow to her first. And then they greet each other with the greeting, Slava Jesu Christo, or Slava, or uh, Christos Vos Kras, which means Christ is risen. Or uh, Slava Jesu Christo, which means Hail to Jesus Christ. 
So the greetings were always even so Catholic. But how many had to make a choice and chose to follow the Catholic doctrine and were put to death for it? And you have the great account of St. John Damascene, who himself painted the icons with his right hand. And there's a famous icon called Our Lady of the Three Hands, because in the icon is painted <clears throat> her hand holding the child Jesus, the, the hand of the child Jesus, but on the bottom there's a third hand in silver. And it's the hand of St. John uh, da Damascene. And why is that hand there? Because the emperor, instead of killing him, he had respect for Bishop De, uh, John of Damascus. So instead of killing him and chopping off his head, he chopped off his right hand, so he could not paint any more icons. But miraculously, he grew a new one. He grew a new hand. And to thank Our Lady, he painted this icon with the third hand. So, and then in the high Middle Ages, how many men and boys your age, boys your age, had to make a choice. Do I go with dad? Do I go to the call of the Pope and the preaching of St. Bernard and the example of a St. Louis the Ninth and so many great leaders in that time? Do I stay home and uh, take it easy and uh, just look after my own selfish interests? Or do I give my life and maybe never come back home to the Crusades? And how many men went and never saw their wives again? And never came home again? And there was a wave of eight crusades of heroism and virtue responding to the call of the Holy Father, the Pope, and a whole series of popes who were good popes. And they, they, they wanted the Catholic people go defend the Holy Land because the Muslims as the history and books don't tell you today, the Muslims were doing what they're doing now. And the liberals are finally waking up seeing, hey, Muslims are, really do follow their Koran, which means massacre those who don't convert. And today they're crucifying them. And the liberal West is finally somewhat waking up to some reality. But this has been going on for centuries. And they were crucifying the Catholic people, raping the women, massacring the children, and in one case, they, they gutted out the body of a governor of a town and filled his body, his skin, with hay and sewed him up and hung him on the city gates. And this is what the Muslims were up to. They were not loving, caring, ecumenical people, nor are they today. At least they're, at least they're not caught by the ecumenical bug. And so even the Catholics of the High Middle Ages what we call the ages of the faith, they all had to make a choice. And they had to do a great sacrifice doing it. And if it wasn't the Crusades, there was the great Crusades of what's called the Cathedral Crusades, with the men giving their life. And it took a whole town to build these churches, these cathedrals, these monasteries. And how many men you know, fell off the towers? How many men... Uh, their blood and tears and sweat were mixed with the concrete. And here, here in Beaumont, in Quebec, you have this magnificent church right here, right across from here. We should be saying Mass in there. That church was built before the French Revolution. That church was built when the Catholics from France that came here remembered the Catholic civilization that they left. And we're bringing that Catholic civilization here. And how many saints came over here to convert the Indians and they were martyred. But this was built before the French Revolution, which is a fascinating thing uh, to think about. And when the French Revolution hit, it was the complete overthrow of the Catholic civilization. And the French Revolution, don't think it was just something way in the past. We're suffering the French Revolution now. Vatican II was nothing but the free Masonic French slash American Masonic Revolution in the church. That's what it is. That's what it is. And it means the overthrow of Christ the King and putting man in the place of God and man's rights in the place of God. 
So why do you think abortion laws are passed and euthanasia laws and Canada has recently passed this horrible assisted suicide law and uh, divorce laws and all these horrible laws and the sodomite laws. What are they all introduced under the name of? They're all brought in under the name of what? Man's rights. Human liberty. Human rights. And in the name of human rights, they bring in the destruction of the human race, really. So, as Pope Leo XIII said, we've heard enough about the rights of man. It's about time we hear again about the rights of Christ the King, the rights of God. And this is what Archbishop Lefebvre stressed. He said the Catholics during the French Revolution, they all had to make a choice. Do we go with the French Revolution and the masonry? And the ideas of the Freemason, which is separation of church and state, and the false liberties of the press, liberty of to teach what you want, liberty to build whatever church and worship you want, or do we stay with the Catholic faith, which meant, usually, their death? And there were some great Catholic uprisings, which we all admire. The great Vendée, and then the, the Catholic men who fought, and many, many martyrs and who were finally uh, surrounded and put to death in the famous drownings of Nantes and uh, the horrible massacres. And near Avrier, the monastery in Avrier, there's the great field of the martyrs, over two to three thousand women, children, priests, old and young, were all shot and uh, bayoneted to death and buried there. And many miracles have come out of that soil and martyrs' bones that are buried there. And then, of course, what's often not remembered is the great uprising of the Flanders Catholics in Belgium and in Flanders. The Catholics who rose up and refused to follow the priests who signed the oath. They were called the Juring Priests. This is very important for us to remember this now, because those priests signed on to something far less than the April 15th doctrinal declaration that was signed by Bishop Fillet and Priest, representing not Bishop Fillet's personal opinion, but representing all the priests of the Society of St. Pius X. This is what we're forgetting. Bishop Fillet's doctrinal declaration represents a new religion. It's a new doctrine. And those priests of 1790s who signed the oath, they signed on something less serious than the doctrinal declaration. And yet, when those priests came to town in Flanders or in the Vendée, they had to have the Masonic police with them because the people wanted them out of their towns. They drove them out of their towns. We don't want you priests who have compromised the faith. And they would not go to their mass. They would not let them baptize their babies and do their marriages. And the Catholic people refused to go to those masses. Were they saying the new mass? Did they have altar girls? Did they have uh, ban banjo drums? No. It was the Tridentine Latin mass. They all wore the cassock. They wore the beretta. They had traditional vestments and incense. But they were truly wolves in sheep's clothing. And that was the same in Mexico. It was the same in Hungary. And the Catholics always had to make a choice. And Archbishop Lefebvre said this. At that time, the Catholics had to say, do I follow the Catholic teaching and the syllabus of errors of Pope Pius IX and Quanta Cura, or do I go with the liberalism? And those who stayed with the Catholic teaching, the syllabus of errors, they were persecuted, they were mocked, they were called backwards, they were called all kinds of names. Nothing new and many of them persecuted and put to death. And during the English persecutions as well, in the Protestant England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, they all had to make a choice. So the good Lord doesn't like us Catholics living too comfortably, actually. He likes us, actually, <laughs> for some reason, he really likes us going to Mass in the catacombs and in the barns and the hotels and in the garages and in, in halls. For some reason, the good Lord likes to keep us on our toes and not get comfortable. And so Archbishop Lefebvre will say, even in the time of Pius X, Catholics had to make a choice. 
Do I go with Pashendi or do I go with the new trend? And the new trend was modernism. And thank God Archbishop Lefebvre not only wrote encyclicals on paper, but he took action with the iron fist and he cleaned house. He took the broom or those, uh, those, those uh, engine blowers and just blew the modernists at 100 miles an hour outside the church. Blew them out. But the snakes went underground and after the death of Pius X, the snakes came back up. And so Catholics had to make a choice also throughout the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. To stay with the tradition of the church or do we go with the new liturgical ideas that were popping up? And Pius XII had to condemn them in uh, Mediator Day in the 1940s. He condemned the ideas of those dropping the black vestments for the Requiem Mass of the dead. He condemned the idea of those who want to bring back the English or the vernacular in the Mass. And he condemned those who wanted to put a table instead of the altar in the name of going back to the early days of the Apostles. So Catholics have always had to make a choice. And then what happened? World War III. The nuclear bomb of Vatican II hit the earth. And it's still causing devastation today, 50 years later. And ever since, Catholics have had to make a huge choice to stay with Catholic tradition or the new religion, a new conciliar belief, a new faith with a new mass and a new priesthood and a mass batard and a, and a, and a batard priests and batard rites and batard ceremonies. And now, since the society by the tent and its leadership now has caved in and has embraced the ideas of the revolution, of the Freemasons, we all have to now make a choice. And we either stay with Catholic tradition in the line of all the popes, or we stay and we choose to go with Bishop Fillet in his new direction. And many people are saying, well, I won't, I won't do anything until there's an agreement. Well, folks, now's the chance to jump off the fence because the agreement has already happened in practice. Argentina now, and you can read it in the latest requisite, they have the uh, actual text from the Argentine government, and it's not just about passports and visas, like they're trying to say. It really means those priests and all their schools and all their apostolate and the seminary of La Reja is under the local diocesan bishops. What does that mean in practice? That means if one priest wants to go start a new mission in another Argentinian state, like Patagonia or the Sierras, they can't do it. They have to have permission of the bishops. You know what that means. Are these novice order bishops going to give permission for that? Of course not. Of course not. They want to destroy Catholic tradition. You don't make peace with the wolves of the Freemasons. And so, really what we're doing is, happy to say, nothing new. Nothing new. St. Athanasius, he had to run for his life all the time. And you know what they called him? The Arian bishops of the time? You know what they called the followers of St. Athanasius? Oh, they're, they're Athanasians. Oh, they're the Athanasians. They're stuck in the mud. They believe in the old faith. Just like we're called Lefebvreists quite often. And, we're, we're, and Archbishop Lefebvre said himself, I'm not no chief of any, of any new parallel church. I am a Catholic bishop doing my duty. And that's all we are. We are Roman Catholics who want to keep our Catholic faith and get to heaven and spread the kingship of Christ and save our soul. <coughs> But to do this, we have all of us to make a choice. And it's not easy. You lose so many friends, you lose so many brothers, you lose some your reputation. Some, some people lose their job. Some are kicked out. Some are scorned. And it's not easy. But our Lord promised, who follows me, take up your cross daily, renounce yourself, and follow me. So let's follow our Lord faithfully. Let's ask the Blessed Mother and ask the Holy Ghost 
the Blessed Virgin Mary, she was there on Pentecost Sunday, which is this coming Sunday, and the Holy Ghost came in fiery tongues and landed first on the Virgin Mary. And then from her, the tongues separated and went on the first Pope and all the, twelve, the other apostles. So the Virgin Mary, she is the spouse of the Holy Ghost. It's through her God wants to pour out His grace. And, and so we must be uh, attached to the Virgin Mary, manfully devoted to her. And uh, love her rosary, love her scapula, love the weapons that she gave us today. <coughs> be greatly devoted to them. And let's turn to her to help us to be firm, to be strong in the faith, and not to compromise, and not to be wish-wash, and not to be um, falling for the tactics of the enemy, which usually is uh, ambiguous language. And the modern world is full of this hypocritical language. What do they call assisted suicide? They call it comfort care. What do they call butchering so many babies in the mother's wombs into the billions? And in Texas, they have a whole, they built on a hospital a whole new wing for late term abortions. It's unspeakable and unthinkable, but that means bigger tubes, that means bigger sinks, it means bigger blades. Horrible. And what do they call that? Pro choice. And what do they call these, these Sodom and Gomorrahites waving their pink flag, <coughs> excuse me, their rainbow flag, which is the color given by Almighty God for representing that He won't punish the world anymore by flood. And they take a Catholic symbol and fly it around for their filth. And what do they call it? Alternative lifestyle or whatever other flowery names they try to give it. And what do they call the horrible... Uh, uh, the list just goes on. The list just goes on. Pro-choice, uh, comfort care, um, pro-this, pro-that. And we must know the enemy. We must know how the enemy works. They use positive, optimistic, ambiguous, nebulous language. And if you want a perfect example of nebulous, ambiguous language, read the April 15th <laughs> doctrinal declaration signed by Bishop Follet, Father Nelly, and Father Fluger. And I beg you, pray for Bishop Follet. He's now in Nickelville. Uh, I wish Nickelville would stand up and say, Bishop Follet, don't come here. You have betrayed the faith. You have compromised the work of, of our founder. Send us Bishop Williamson. Send us Bishop Four. But we don't have any more Catholics like this anymore. They're all, they're all becoming rainbows themselves, spiritually. So pray for Bishop Follet. He's in this, he has led his priests, all of his priests of the Society of Pius X, are in great danger now of losing their faith. They're in serious danger of losing their faith. And they're going to laugh at that for me saying this. But it's very true. <clears throat> because once the leadership caves in on a document like April 15, 2012, the six conditions, they're finished. They're finished. And the proof of them being finished is, <coughs> let me ask you, will Bishop Fillet consecrate a bishop now without Rome's approval? after he condemned the consecration of Bishop Four and sided with the conciliar Rome to condemn Catholic tradition, do you think he's going to consecrate a bishop? No. And do you think if he does consecrate a bishop with Rome's approval, do you think that candidate is going to be one that Rome will disapprove of? No. That's, it's finished. As one society priest honestly said, the conciliar society, he said, uh, Truthfully, the SSPX is finished. It's over. The future is in the resistance. And not that any priest of the resistance is anything. We are nothing, just to quote St. Paul. We're nothing. But Our Lady wants it down to nothing. Because her victory, her triumph, is going to be her work chosen by God. And she will overthrow the powers of the Freemasons and the New World Order. They're going, to have, they're going to come close to their trophy, but they're not going to get it yet. They'll get it after the chastisement and after the, 
the period of peace that Our Lady spoke of, the victory of Christ the King. Then the Antichrist will have his little, his little three and a half years of glory. But even then, that will be overthrown by Christ the King. So persevere, little flock, here in Quebec. Hold fast to the beautiful faith that your ancestors brought here and built this stone church with their sweat and the faith that was passed down even before the French Revolution. What a trophy, this church, and all these churches in the beautiful Catholic, once Catholic Quebec. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. Pray for us, Mary.